1949 and 1950, those like two years or so was a really fundamental turning point in the Cold War. And it's a turning point that really profoundly shapes well into the 21st century. It shapes global rivalries. It shapes U.S. domestic um, and fiscal policy. It, it shapes how we think, how we react to different countries. It shapes national relations. It is a profound moment. So the turning point, what, what were the catalysts? Well, first, in 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its own atomic bomb in 1949. And this shocked the world. It shocked the United States. It also led to a real uh, just hysteria in the United States over the fear of communist spies. The Soviet atomic bomb development was assisted in part by individuals like Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Um, the scientist um, Klaus Fuchs, which had helped to um, provide information to the Soviet Union about uh, the U.S. atomic secrets. And this was seen as helping the Soviets develop their own bomb. This resulted in, 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 in a, a red scare during the 1950s. This was the period in which the, the young Senator Joseph McCarthy began smearing individuals for suspected communist uh, affiliation, began um, seeking the, uh, the resignations and attacking individuals for being alleged members of the Communist Party. Americans in the early 1950s uh, were intensely fearful of communist spies around every corner. Uh, the escalation of the Cold War seemed very apparent, and Americans now also feared the potentiality of a Soviet atomic or nuclear attack. So American society in the 1950s was very much shaped by the fear of a pending nuclear war and the fear of, of subversives, of communists, of spies and traitors that might be around every corner. They might be living in your own suburban neighborhood. In 1949, too, China fell to the communist forces of Mao Zedong, which is who is pictured here. Mao was a communist figure, and he had been fighting with Chiang Kai-shek, who was the nationalist leader in China. His party was called the Guomindang, though they were known as the nationalists. And for over a decade, Mao and Chiang Kai-shek had fought in the Chinese Civil War for control of China. Well, in 1949, Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists achieved victory in the Chinese Civil War. And the forces of Chiang Kai-shek fled China and took refuge in an island off the coast of China, the island of Taiwan, hoping that this would be a place from where they would eventually retool and, and come back and retake um, China to the uh, military leader Chiang Kai-shek. So China falls to communism. In 1950, largely at the behest of Joseph Stalin, the communist North Koreans, Korea was divided north and south at the end of World War II, again, not unlike Germany, where the north was influenced by the communists and the south was influenced by the United States and its allies. Well, in 1950, the North Korean leadership invaded South Korea, and this became a, a huge national emer or a huge global emergency for uh, the allies and the, uh, the United States and its allies. And the United States inspired a United Nations action in Korea, though the United States did most of the fighting there. And to make a long story short, in this picture here are United States soldiers using flamethrowers in 1952 in the Korean War. But the United States would, would initially, under the leadership of General Douglas MacArthur, push the North Korean invasion all the way back to the border of the now and newly communist China the Yalu River on the very north. And China would then invade with massive uh, infantry, um, a massive army of infantry soldiers. And the United States faced human wave assaults. And the United Nations and the United States soldiers were pushed back to the dividing line today between North and South Korea. And, and this is an incredibly unpopular war that resulted in 
really the demise of the presidency of Harry Truman and his inability to win election uh, for a second term as president. The result of these turning points is really, uh, in the United States, is a response in which the United States can, it really expands containment. Containment after 49 and 50 was no longer just about Western Europe. It was no longer just about Berlin. It was no longer just about West Germany or Greece or Turkey or France or Italy. Now, containment was a global thing. And the United States believed now it had to contain communism anywhere it spread throughout the world. This is the emergence of global containment, and it was a much, much bigger undertaking than just uh, worrying about Western Europe and Japan and a couple of other sort of um, strong points in the world. So containment as a policy becomes global as a result of these critical turning points in 1949 and 1950. And this really fundamentally shapes the United States, its government, its economics, and its role in the world. First of all, here you see Harry Truman, President of the United States, signing the National Security Act of 1947. So prior to 1949 and 1950, there were already some fundamental changes um, developing as a result of the Cold War. So the United States is now chosen with the containment policy to become really a global power which means you need to have a large standing military, a large military budget. Uh, you have to have a coordinated national security apparatus to be able to understand and be engaged in the world um, in a meaningful way at, at any and all times. The National Security Act created the Defense Department, centered ultimately in Virginia at the Pentagon. The Defense Department houses the five branches of the U.S. Armed Services. Before you had, you had a war department, there wasn't a sort of uh, coalesced singular entity where civilian leaders would head the sort of uh, government spending and policy decisions made by the branches of the military. The CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, was created as a result of this, whose job, of course, was to be involved in intelligence, spying, covert activities um, all around you know, the world during the Cold War, whether in the developing world or whether in, um, in, in Western Europe, in Berlin, in the Soviet Union. The Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Joint Chiefs of Staff is the, basically the leaders of the major branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff would have a chair, and the chair would now be a member of a National Security Council. The National Security Council, every president has a National Security Council. And these are advisors representing the entire cabinet of the presidency, as well as other advisors not formally in the, in the cabinet, who then advise the president on matters of foreign policy. The Cold War was such an urgent development, too, that during the 50s, the draft was resumed. We had a peacetime military draft in the United States. Uh, famous figures like Elvis Presley was drafted, drafted into the military in the 1950s. One of the biggest changes that comes as a result of the Cold War, and particularly uh, not just the developments with the containment policy, as you see here in 1947 and 48, but with those fundamental changes in 1948, uh, 1949, and 1950, was the emergence of what's called the military-industrial complex. What the military-industrial complex is, and I'll just, uh, this is, uh, it's relatively simple, actually. So as a result of the need to, to globally contain communism anywhere in the world, no matter where you have communism spreading throughout the world, the United States had to contain it. Well, as a result of that, you have to have a huge military budget. You have to be prepared to build the most high-tech equipment. You have to be prepared to build nuclear weapons, uh, bombers that can, uh, that can fly unprecedented distances. You have to have soldiers in your army. You have to, to build rocket technology. You have to build massive navies and aircraft carriers. It's very expensive. If you want to be able to react to any expansion of communist influence, no matter where it occurs in the world, you have to have a military budget that's more or less in line with fighting a war at all times. 
So military spending soars as a result of this need to contain communism globally. The average annual, and these numbers you see over here, this is uh, military budget spending uh, all the way up to 1996. Military spending soars because of the needs of the United States being a global military power ready to take action and contain communism wherever it might spread. The result of this domestically in the United States is the new military apparatus in the United States becomes fundamentally intertwined with American society. Before World War II, the United States always had a very, very small peacetime military. Its military budgets were very small, and it wasn't focused on being ready to act in any part of the world at any time to, um, um, to fight national security and foreign policy endeavors wherever they might occur. The United States did not have that attitude before World War II. The Cold War and the emergence of the United States as a world power changes all of that. As a result of this massive spending, consistent military spending, out of the need to contain communism throughout the world, particularly after 1950, you have a situation where, and you see 1952's military budget here um, is very high at this point. It's about half of what you saw at the end of World War II, which is, uh, which is a pretty incredibly high military budget. The result of this is you had lots and lots of jobs in the United States that were now in the national security industries, building planes, building bombs, building technologies, for the aerospace industry, um, building military equipment. So now you had lots of everyday Americans working in um, the sort of greater military industrial type of jobs. You had businesses, uh, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, uh, major manufacturers that now were making lots and lots of money building military equipment and selling that military equipment to the United States government, selling that military equipment um, through the United States government to countries abroad. As a result of this, businesses and economics rely on this. Jobs for individuals rely on this. And as a result on the, of this, politicians rely on this industry as well. So the, the, one of the consequences, unintended consequences, of the need for preparedness and involvement in the world to contain communism was that the military business in, uh, enterprise, if you will, becomes intertwined in American politics and domestic society. And that poses potential problems when it comes to the decisions that might be made in foreign policy, when it comes to decisions that might be made with American jobs, with American budgets, um, in these types of things, American government spending, in these types of things. It can very much lead to the military having an influence in a government that is supposed to be a civilian government. One of the big sort of um, drivers of these now massive military budgets was, of course, nuclear weapons. With the Soviet Union detonating its bomb in 1949, not only do you have a kind of a hysteria in the United States over communism, but you also now have both countries locked in a race to build more and more, uh, not only in quantity, but in powerful weapons. And after the Soviet bomb, the United States and the Soviet Union are racing for what was called the super. And the super was the hydrogen bomb. This is really a, the emergence of thermonuclear weapons. They're massively more powerful than the atom bomb. They were uh, driven largely by the ideas of Edward Teller, who was one of the physicists of the Manhattan Project, and also um, uh, an individual who had escaped uh, the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, developing these types of weapons was controversial. Uh, the architect for the containment policy, um, actually... Um, George Kennan is his name. He was the architect of the containment policy. And he believed that the United States should just have a few atomic bombs just in case, but it should avoid engaging in a nuclear arms race. And when the Truman administration, President Harry Truman, remember Franklin Roosevelt died in office in 1945, and Harry Truman became president, when Harry Truman 
made the decision in 1949 that they were going to develop the super, this thermonuclear bomb. George Kennan, the architect of the containment policy, resigned his position in, um, in, in the executive branch, in the Truman administration. The United States went forward. The United States and the Soviet Union both developed thermonuclear bombs. This is the Castle Romeo test, the United States' test in 1954 of its hydrogen bomb thermonuclear device. The weapon was 1,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. In the 1950s, the United States and the Soviet Union increasingly become engaged in not only a race for more nuclear weapons, you start to see now a missile race. And of course, the Soviet Union won the race uh, in the short term with its launching of Sputnik, uh, the satellite, into orbit. And Sputnik was a revolution because, of course, satellite technology is how everything from televisions to internet to cell phones, all of our you know, communication infrastructure in the 21st century is at some place related to satellite technology. But Sputnik, while it was the first satellite launched by the Soviet Union in 1957, the real fear was that, for the United States, was that if you could send a satellite into space, you could put a nuclear warhead on um, the missile, which was called an R-7 ballistic missile. And you could launch that missile at the United States. And so it really enhances growth of fear over nuclear wars. During this period of time, the United States and the Soviet Union tested hundreds of these types of weapons in the open atmosphere, in Nevada, in New Mexico, in the Pacific, in Siberia. They were tested all around the world. And in 1963, a major breakthrough came with the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, in which the United States, under John Kennedy, and Nikita Khrushchev agreed that they, they should stop testing these, these weapons in the open atmosphere. And they signed the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty agreeing to that. Really the first um, attempt at uh, nuclear arms agreements between the two. Anyway, the two ultimately construct, these two empires, these two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union's world powers, we'll say, um, construct thousands of nuclear warheads. By the 1970s, the United States had over 30,000 nuclear warheads. By the 1980s, the Soviet Union would surpass that. All amidst the idea that during this period, initially, you see, initially, if you look here, in the 50s, thinkers in American policy apparatus kind of still thought, hey, you could have a nuclear war, and it wouldn't necessarily mean that everybody would be annihilated. They still thought there was a way to do this. With weapons like this, and advanced missile, missile technology, and levels of, of arsenals like this, increasingly it became clear that there was no way that you could have a nuclear war between two major nuclear powers and that humanity would survive. If you had a major nuclear exchange, it might result in something called a nuclear winter, in which, uh, like massive volcanic eruptions, uh, the, 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 the uh, climate would fundamentally cool as a result of all of the um, all of the detonation of these nuclear weapons, which itself might result in a collapse of human civilization. So uh, by the 1970s, both sides came to believe that any use of these weapons would be potentially uh, the death knell for human civilizations. And this is where the concept of, of mutually assured destruction, though that concept existed in the 50s, Mutually assured destruction, the idea that if one side uses it, the other side would use it, and so no one wins, and so it would deter both sides from using it. That notion becomes increasingly common in the 60s and 70s, mutually assured destruction, or MAD. Despite that fact, though, despite what we know about this, today the number one issue in the world is nuclear proliferation in terms of foreign policy. Um, the number one concerns are nuclear powers engaged in areas that are potentially very dangerous. North and South Korea, uh, Pakistan and India, Israel and Iran. Uh, nuclear proliferation is a term that refers to the spreading of nuclear arms and technologies throughout the world, where it's increasingly possessed by more and more countries. It's possessed technically, I believe, by... Uh, uh, 
I think there's nine countries today. Uh, there might be 10 today. Let's see, Britain, the United States, France, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, um, and Israel. Israel is, so there's nine. Israel's undeclared, but uh, there's a great fear uh, that as more countries gain nuclear weapons, the likelihood that they'll be used increases. And that fear over nuclear proliferation is one of the most paramount fears in the world today. Um, and of course, with countries like Iran and North Korea, uh, it's uh, regularly in the headlines.